Um, here we are, Emily Dickinson, the poetry of Lent, Lent number one. I think it's important uh, as we begin this work of conversation and, you know, it's, it's across such a distance that it's hard to feel the room in the sense. And, and, uh, and again, I think it's really important at, at the beginning of any kind of devotional thing to set the intention and set the space, right? Um, which is the churches did that naturally for us because you drove to a special building into a special place and you lit the special candle and you sat in a special chair and, and it already made sense. It all made sense, right? So, so here I would invite you all to just, again, uh, become a aware of where your body at, is at. We're singing a song about being open, which is something that the heavens are going to do in the story and the flower is going to do in the poem today. And, and so, so I have a, a song that speaks of being, being open. And, uh, but I do want you to take one really super deep breath just to like notice how that breath is feeling. Is it all up in your chest? Is it down in your stomach? Where, where is the breath going? Where is the breath not going to? And just be aware of the tension. So take that deep breath in. And then let it all out. And just notice, notice if your body is carrying some thoughts, some anxiety, is the stock market up? Is the stock market down? Is there your neighbor bugging you? Is the cat going crazy? You know, like what, where, where's that tension? What's the distraction? And just become present in this moment where perhaps in faith, we can trust that, that there's going to be some new openness, some new knowledge, some new way of seeing. So take another huge deep breath in and just become super center. Nice and in and out. And so I have this song, I think the slide is up now. And, and, and the first slide, I just want you to repeat uh, the whole first verse after I sing it. It goes like this. I am opening up with sweet surrender to the luminous love light of the one. Try that. I am opening up with sweet surrender to the luminous love light of the one. One more time. Opening up with sweet surrender to the luminous love light of the one. And now the second part goes like this. I am opening, I am opening, I am opening, I am opening. And so to sing this together, normally we would then say, okay, who's got a harmony for that first part? And who's got something else to add in? And I would love to unmute you all and jump into the same room and do that, but we can't. So I've pre-recorded something that's, it's not perfect, but it's me singing both parts. And that'll invite you to sing both parts as they happen in a round and become open. But the, the, the key moment here is to allow yourself to see where you're closed, see where your mind is kind of stuck, see where your, your breath isn't really flowing or your body is kind of all like not, not really feeling feeling great and then just be open to this moment this idea of the, the luminous love light of the one i am opening up in sweet surrender to the luminous love light of the one i am opening up in sweet surrender to the luminous love light of the one i am opening, opening up in sweet surrender to i am the luminous love light opening of the one. i am opening up in sweet surrender to i am luminous love light opening I am opening up in sweet surrender to the luminous love light of the one. I am opening up in sweet surrender to the luminous love light of the one. I am opening up in sweet surrender to the luminous love light of the one. I am opening up in sweet surrender to the luminous love light opening. Emily Dickinson, we hardly even talked about who this person might have been. So I found this, this brief video that I wanted to show uh, that'll give us a little bit more of what your average sort of grade nine student would learn about Emily Dickinson before we jump into some of the poetry, just so we learn a little bit more about who this person is.
Often a writer or poet will try to publish their writings during their lifetime. But in some cases, like the story of Emily Dickinson, no one knew she was a master poet until after her death. Emily Elizabeth Dickinson was born in December of 1830 in Amherst, Massachusetts, which is 50 miles from Boston. She was one of three children. Emily's grandfather was the founder of Amherst College, and her father worked at Amherst College and also served as a state legislator. Emily was an intelligent child and wrote rhyming stories for her classmates. She went to school at Amherst College, a college her grandfather founded, and the Mount Holyoke Female Seminary, but suffered from bad health and missed a lot of school. It's believed she had problems with depression as well as physical illnesses. Emily was a good student, even though she was absent from school much of the time. Because of a bad cough, her father finally took her out of school and brought her home in 1848. After Emily returned home, she became somewhat of a recluse. A recluse is someone who prefers to be alone. Because of her shyness and feeling uncomfortable in groups of people, she seldom left her home throughout her life. The few times she traveled gave her the chance to meet interesting people she wrote letters to for many years. Emily filled her need to be social through her letters and her poetry. She was an avid reader and was inspired to write poetry from the books she read. Over her lifetime, she nearly wrote 1,800 poems. Though Emily lived a secluded life, her poetry shows she wasn't without imagination and an ability to write beautiful and meaningful poems. She was inspired by nature and deep feelings, which she was able to express with her expert use of words. Emily never married and spent her entire life living in her family's large home. She died there at the age of 56 from kidney disease. Emily had given her sister instructions to burn all her letters after her death. In doing so, her sister came across a box full of Emily's poems, which her family knew nothing of. A family friend typed up the poems and published the first edition of Emily's poems. Her poetry became famous and is still regarded as having a great influence on 20th century poetry. So here's the thing that happened. <laughs> Emily Dickinson has this like America's sweetheart darling child reputation, right? She's she's like like this is Studies Weekly, America's textbook, and it, it sort of has this 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 version of Emily Dickinson which was popularized. And then I started to do more research and then I started to look into well what movies have been made and what has gone on. And, and, and it's, it's interesting how little you can know about somebody or how, how one picture of somebody like that, like that little thing, like what, what are we imagining when we think of this Emily Dickinson, right? It's like, oh, ah, sort of a mousy little sick child maybe, right? And didn't, didn't really get out much. And, uh, you know, maybe she, she, there was some way she wasn't good at like social interactions, but somehow was brilliant in the pen. That's where my brain went. Like, where did your brain, like when you think Emily Dickinson, what do you think of Emily Dickinson? Um, and, and it's important, like we're, we're just doing a little thought experiment about, about truth. Like what do we know and how do we think we know it here, right? Um, um, and so so what have you heard of Emily Dickinson? Does anyone have a history with Emily Dickinson? Have you read many of her poems before today? Was there something that was amazing? Just jump on in and, and, and chat if there's something there. Um, or maybe it's all brand new because this is an American poet, you know, from Boston, you know, like we, we don't we don't maybe know her much. Um, uh, Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I know exactly what you've told me so far, right? Yeah. Well, I'm going to show you the next slide here, and this this will um uh it, it will come up around um uh, the recluse part. Yeah, yeah. There's this part about uh, about being a recluse, and she oh she had some health issues and had to go away for a while, right? Um, and then in my brain, in my uh, in my small town brain, it's like oh where did Jane go? Oh Jane had to go stay with a cousin for nine and a half months because she wanted to, you know what I mean? Like there's the way a community tells a story about itself. <laughs> um, and so in my brain, again, I've got all these stereotypes of uh, Massachusetts and Boston in 1850, right? You know, like this idea. And, uh, but who is this Emily Dickinson? We've got photos of her, we've got these things. We have a, we have a lifetime, 1830 to 1886. And I, I came across these four names. And the question is how, like, like in, in the in the very um, 
in, in the very brief little intro there, we have uh, Emily Dickinson's family friend published her poems. Oh, who is this family friend? I didn't even think to ask until I found this web page. And, and follow me through on this if you can. So Emily Dickinson is the daughter of uh, privilege, right? Um, although she wasn't that rich because her mansion wasn't that big. It was kind of a small Massachusetts mansion, but wealthy enough that she never actually had to work uh, or, or you know, provide for her own means. Um, like the, there was a family wealth there. The family opened a university. So, I mean, you know, you can see there's sort of some wealth there. Um, she's very adept at school, but then she's ill and she moves home and then she writes. And there's this very tidy version of history. But considering that many of the letters that were written and many Many of the poems are written were about her neighbor Susan, who married Emily's brother Austin, right? So we got a mansion, we got a next door neighbor Susan who's married to Emily's brother Austin. Austin has this incredibly public affair with Mabel. Mabel works at the, the family university. So it's, it's suddenly suddenly very awkward and strange is going on in this kind of this small town kind of way. <laughs> Emily, Susan, Austin, Mabel and this relationship and how does this come together? And then only 10 poems are ever really published and Emily sort of lives this life sort of secluded. But then after Emily dies and many of the letters are destroyed as per her alleged request of her sister, her poetry actually ends up with Mabel. Mabel is the family friend who uh, publishes all the poetry. Uh, because she works at a university, right? Um, awkward family friend. Is family friend, when does your mistress become a family friend? I'm not sure uh, at, at what point, like maybe the healing happens over a couple of years or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> but, uh, but, 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 but the family friend then publishes all of the letters. But in recent scholarship, we found that a lot of Emily's letters were actually, uh, a lot of the poetry may have included Susan's name, which Mabel has actually, who apparently did not like Susan, gone through and erased or scribbled out or taken out. So Susan has been pulled out of a lot of the poetry and all of these things. It, it's very strange. So now we know a little bit of the backstory of this person, Emily. So, so what do we think about Emily Dickinson now? Like, like um, because um, like, again, we're, we are, we are moving towards, uh, the, the Jesus, the Bible study of the scripture and the poem about a flower, but, but, but what we think we know about Emily sort of shifts very suddenly. The queer community is all about Emily Dickinson right now. Um, and there is this other narrative of Emily Dickinson that she was not a reclusive person. She was a vivacious, incredibly held back by her family kind of person who had a very special relationship with Susan, who had a very strained relationship with her husband, Austin, who had a very open relationship with Mabel. <laughs> As you see, this whole thing kind of plays out and there's a lot more life going on than somebody who you know, like, like I think of my, my initial picture of Emily Dickinson, the recluse is almost somebody who would be one of those people that I could almost imagine not stringing together words out loud as if there was some impediment to speaking the words, but she could write them really well. And then this whole other narrative of who's really going on and who, who gets to control the story of Emily and who gets to decide ooh, how Emily Dickinson is remembered. And, and this, is where, this is where I was really surprised how much more interesting the story of Emily Dickinson really was. Not just reclusive poet, but in fact, somebody who is exploding the poetry world and professors and all these people having big debates and discussions. And, 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 and my goodness, I guess after we die, people like to talk about us a lot. So maybe that changes, uh, <laughs> you know, sort of what we can say or, or who gets to control kind of that legacy um, and how that's going to be. Um, so what we think we know about Emily and what we think we know about any piece of literature or any person that we are not actually currently talking to telling us their version of the story, you know, such as Jesus or the disciples of Jesus, or, or even like what's going on in the, the, the passion of the person. So imagine now not Emily Dickinson reserved um, person who kind of observed life but didn't really live life. But now we start to imagine what if she's somebody of great passion who experienced a lot of deep relationships, but it had to be held in secret. Um, it had to be held away from the public eye because it was, you know, it was Massachusetts in 18. 45, right? Um, and, and certain things just were not talked about. And, and so I think that's a little bit of an Emily Dickinson history. And we can, we can, we can jump into that a little bit more uh, 
a little bit about what we think we know in the poem. I have produced most of what the chapel will look like for Monday for the students. And this is, I think, a good way to let the students speak a little bit. We'll hear the poems we're talking about. We'll hear a brief sermon by me, and, and then we can uh, open it up for discussion about which parts of the poem and which parts of the scripture make sense, or whether I should re-edit this entire video because I'm a heretic and I've gone the wrong way with this and you're leading the youth astray, Sean. Um, so let's take uh, this next little bit to watch what will be the video for the chapel for Monday. Does that make sense? Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, you hate nothing you have made, and you forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create in us new and honest hearts, so that truly repenting of our sins, we may receive from you and the God of all mercy, full pardon and forgiveness through your sons. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Hello, Luther College High School. My name is Sean Bell, and I'm the chaplain at Luther College at the university side. Over these next 40-ish days, we will have five chapels based on a five-part Lenten series, leaning quite heavily on the poetry of Emily Dickinson, also bringing in a couple of my friends from other schools, the chaplain Craig Wentland from Augustana in Camrose, which is part of the University of Alberta, and, my, and the chaplain Ann Anderson from Martin Luther University over in Waterloo, Kitchener area in that area. So we will be all bringing you a little bit of the Lenten reflections as we move through. 40 days in Lent, coincidentally, 40 days of wilderness wandering for those people lost in the wilderness with Moses. Coincidentally, 40 days that Jesus spent wandering around the wilderness, being tempted and all the things. And just before that temptation, we get today's story. And so we have a poem about the temptation or the, the responsibility of being a flower, but we also have a Bible verse about the kingdom drawn near. Listen to these stories as they come together. Bloom is a result to meet a flower. Bloom is a result to meet a flower and casually glance would scarcely cause one to suspect the minor circumstance, assisting in the bright affair so intricately done, then offered as a butterfly to the meridian. To pack the bud, oppose the worm, obtain its right of dew, adjust the heat, elude the wind, escape the prowling bee, great nature not to disappoint, awaiting her that day. To be a flower is profound responsibility. Responsibility, did you hear it? The responsibility of a flower? Do you ever look at a, a flower or a bunch of flowers and wondered, like, what are they doing? Do they just kind of sit there. If you just glance at them, they're just kind of there. But then if you pause like the poet does and look, deeply into what's going on, the intricate dance, the preparation of everything a flower is doing to obtain the right of dew, adjust the heat, elude the wind, escape the prowling bee. You can see the flower is quite an active thing. It is something more going on than is first glance, is first noticeable, is the poetry. And now the Bible verse. The Holy Gospel according to Mark chapter 9 verses 1 to 15. Glory to you, O Lord. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death 
until they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up the high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, is it good for us to be here? Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved, listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming from the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead could mean. Then they asked him, why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? He said to them, Elijah is indeed coming first to restore all things. How then is it written from the Son of Man? Then he is to go through many sufferings and be cheated with contempt. But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written about him. When they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them, and some scribes arguing with them. When the whole crowd saw him, they immediately overcome with awe, and they ran forward to greet him. Thanks be to God for that story. You see, with new eyes, they see Jesus, and there's an awe, there's an aura, there's a something going on. Since that mountain, he's gone from kind of a guy that's just telling stories, and now he's somebody a little bit different. Rewind in the story. When Jesus was baptized, he wanders out into the edge of the wilderness where his cousin John is baptizing people. And as he's put under the water for baptism and pulled up, it's a ritual cleansing, a baptism of repentance, metanoia, to turn around, to look at things a new way, to change your mind. Jesus comes out of the water, and some say the heavens broke open that day. And God said, this is my child, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Curiously, Jesus hasn't done anything yet, but God is well pleased. This is part of what baptism promise is, is that before you even had a thought to do anything, God is well pleased. You are the beloved. That's part of the promise we join Jesus in. And then Jesus is whisked out for 40 days in the wilderness. 40 days, that number coming up about learning in the wilderness, being, well, Tempted by Satan, they say. Tempted by a way of being human that Jesus rejects. And it takes 40 days to kind of figure it out, 40 nights. He comes back and begins his ministry, the stories, the miracles, and eventually ends up on top of this mountain on the story that we get to today. And as they go up onto the mountains, his skin shines white and, and he, he's a blinding light all over the place. And the disciples see Jesus transfigured before them. On the mountaintop, they say, this is amazing. Let's build three shelters. And they talk about some great people from the past, Moses, Elijah. Let's see if we can like, we can, like build a shrine here. We'll make this the special place. And Jesus, before it just listens, and then the heavens again break open. And God speaks, this is my child, the, the beloved, listen to him. And then everybody passes out and the light show is over. And you can imagine those disciples waking up on that mountain and seeing Jesus there and Jesus saying, all right, let's go. We're headed down into where the people are. We're headed off to bring this message down the hill, not a mountaintop where we're going to live here forever. We're going to go down and take on the responsibility of this gift we've been given. It's an amazing gift we've been given. And when you look closer, it's not just another day. You're not just another human. And I could say something about Maybe like the poet, a flower. Maybe the responsibility of growing and changing. And as the flower took on all the poetic ideas of that, you take on all this belovedness and giftedness of who you are. And you find your way into the world, taking this promise from God that you are beloved, but then also taking this responsibility, the huge responsibility of being human. The responsibility to be kind, the responsibility to love, the, the responsibility to look out for all of the needs of your neighbors. Lent is 40 days long, 40 days of self-reflection and examination of what it is to be a beloved child of God, to, to wear that title, I am beloved. 
but then to also figure out what responsibility is this? What new life is coming as spring begins to come around us? What are you called to do, called to be, called to live into as we head towards that big promise of Easter? Amen. A little madness in the spring. A little madness in the spring is wholesome even for the king. But God be with the clown who ponders this tremendous scene, this whole experiment of green, as if it were his own. And so let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for declaring us beloved. We give you thanks for the signs of spring that are everywhere. We pray that you would bubble up in all of us a sense of our belovedness so that we may go into the world not so worried about our performance or our grades or pandemics or the worries, but more inspired to engage and embrace and love all that you have first given to us. Bless us this day as we go. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there we go. Um, so we have some poems and we have some scriptures and now we have a sermon and kind of a little chapel thing that doesn't have prayers in it. I got to finish that sometime before Monday. Um, uh, and, and partially what we converse now for the next 20 minutes, I think is going to help me either go back and re-edit everything I said or perhaps uh, I'll do that. So, so we have a poem. I've got it up on the screen there, Bloom. Uh, Bloom is result to meet a flower. Uh, this is very much Emily Dickinson style of uh, ignoring grammar rules and sentence structure. Um, some of her poems follow a, a very strict kind of um, uh, kind of a meter, you know, like where you have to like make things rhyme or make things follow a certain amount of syllables. Um, but, th but this one does not. It, it's a little all over the place. So initial responses or thoughts uh, to, to anything. We've got, uh, we have this poem and we have this Bible verse we can, we can look around too. So, yeah. Well, Sean, um... One thing that's been learned in the last uh, 10 or 20 years is that plants are not passive by any means. And, and farmers are having to completely rethink the way in which we um, farm. We used to think that farmers farmed the plants, but now we know that the plants are actually farming the soil. And this notion that comes through the poem is that the plant is, you know, you might call it passively active right? The, the plant can't move anywhere, but it's, but it is doing everything that it can to um, fulfill its purpose in the station that it's landed. And this is exactly what the science is telling us. And Emily Dickinson just happened to be 150 years ahead of her time in this regard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, some people call this the responsibility of a flower poem, too. The idea that a flower has responsibilities. Uh, <laughs> things has got to get done. Um. One of the things that I just thought about was there's that old saying about bloom where you're planted. <laughs> and so the meridian in the poem, that's a, a spot or a place on earth, I think. So... That was, and the flower just doesn't happen. It's the minor, I liked the minor circumstances that assist and, and contribute to the, um, the bloom, the finished bloom. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I feel like I see a connection between the line of uh, to be a flower is profound responsibility and the the story about Jesus that we read that, uh, you know, the, the need for 
Jesus to take on that responsibility and kind of all of this stuff under the surface that we don't see acting in behind uh, Jesus becoming who he is. Yeah, that's why I love the narrative nature of the Jesus stories, right? Because there's an unfolding of knowledge. They move from a place of not seeing to a place of seeing and interpreting it. It's like, oh, here's the light show. We're gonna. This is everything. And then, no, no, actually, the story keeps going. <laughs> you know, uh, it continues to unfold. Uh, uh, and again, who wouldn't want to go live at the top of a mountain and just live there uh, in some sort of perfect uh, utopia, right? Um, but no, that's not that's not it. There's a responsibility aspect of this. There's a, an ongoing unfolding nature. And that if you just pause and look a little deeper, there's so much more going on th than you thought. Um, um, I, I have a friend, uh, she's a plant scientist uh, here in uh, Regina, and it, she can walk into a field of grass and just stare at it for an hour and a half. <laughs> and she, I, like, I look at a field of grass and I'm like, it's a field of grass. And she looks at a field of grass and she's like, she sees 37 types of grass. And, you know, she sees the disease process in different places and the water, like she, she just knows all this stuff. Like there's this, there's this depth of knowledge that is, is hidden under the surface uh, that, 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 that's, that's, uh, that you just have to pause and notice. And then there it is, right? It's, uh, yeah. I, I like the start because it says to meet a flower and it reminds me of like the disciples kind of witnessing Jesus in that experience, like you said, and how like they have kind of that responsibility because they've seen that and now they have to go out and act on it. Mm -hmm. And bloom, bloom is result. Like, like, yeah. I got to weigh in again. So Jesus in the incarnation, right? infinite cosmic power but here he he places himself in human flesh in a very particular spot in history right and now you know how does this liken to this this flower and, and jesus has this deep sense of responsibility and in the wilderness he's obviously wrestling that through trying to figure out what is his responsibility in this moment in time, just like that flower. And I wonder about Emily Dickinson too. It's it's cool to get a little, just a teeny glimpse. Here she is kind of stuck in a house, whether that's by her own insecurity or by her family's insistence or by her society's um, um, knowing glances, right? But she's stuck in her house and here she is blooming and it's like she knows what the world doesn't know. She's a poet and she's writing something. And then I think of our churches and what it means for us to bloom. We're stuck in these little buildings with these little congregations, with these almost innocuous Zoom meetings. And yet we're called uh, to bloom where we are. And yeah, I'm, I'm getting a lot out of this poem now. I really like the determination of the flower where it says, um, oppose the worm and obtain its right of dew. It's okay to have, um, it's okay to exhibit strength wherever you are planted. I like, uh, it made me think about the um, Jan Richardson poem that was uh, out for this, this time of church year two. And she talks about, the beloved, that's where we start. We start at the beloved. You are called the beloved. So it's its almost the, it connects me to this little flower. It's the beauty of the flower. We start there. And then the rest of it all unfolds and we talk about its purpose and we talk about its responsibility, but but we start at its the beauty of its creation. And I feel like that's in the same in the way we talk about Jesus, the way we talk about the church, God's creation. We start at the beloved. Uh, one one commentary on the poem was uh, in some of her other writings. Uh, Emily speaks about her her words um, being sort of like flowers of speech, right? So if we're going to push the metaphors even further uh, and, and get away from like you're a flower, you should bloom. Like like that, that would be one direct metaphor if you're right. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, which is I, I took that on a little bit for the students to say, look, like like you are this thing and now bloom, right? This is kind of how that goes. But um, um, it, there's, there's a power in this stopping and noticing and and uh, 
and 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 then having written it down and having impacted so many people around her, be, being one of America's best known and beloved poets, the, these flowers of speech, these like like the the responsibility or the power is still there too in an unassuming way. They're just words. How powerful are they? But they are, you know, incredibly powerful, right? Like they they go. Um, it, it's part of what we are. Um, stories. On the very last line, it says to be a flower, or you could substitute beloved, like Anne, Anne was saying, is profound responsibility. And that makes me wonder, hmm, what, what, do, what do others think about that? What is our responsibility if we're beloved? That makes me think of the the promise given to Abraham that, you know, I'll make you a great nation and many nations will be blessed through you. That it's not, you don't receive this blessing from God just to keep it for yourself, but to share it with many nations. And it's almost like you have to have the exploration of what does it mean to beloved to to be beloved, to to know what the responsibility is. We have to understand. We have to understand uh, whose we are, the gifts we have. Uh, understand that belovedness in order to know what the responsibility then is. That call response thing, Tim, you're really good at telling that story. That call and response. How how do we respond to that understanding of what it is to be beloved? Another thing is it could be about Emily Dixon being like, or Dickinson being um, a woman and kind of like that flower and sort of like, you can look at a flower and just think, oh, it's really beautiful, but mm -hmm. there's not much of a meaning to it. Whereas like, she's kind of saying there's a lot of meaning and responsibility to her role. I kind of like that. Yeah, almost as if the flower had sort of some like, oh, I'm just a flower. But no, no, you flower, you, you resist the worm, you, you gather, you, you, you know, you're more than just creating beauty, as Tim has said, too, you till the soil, you, um, uh, how, how would you say it, Tim? It's like your responsibility to the micronutrients of the soil content is blah, 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 something sciencey. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so, yeah, yeah, I like that. Well, when you yeah, when you think of a woman's responsibility here now, from what what I know of my two minutes of Emily Dickinson, she wasn't rearing children, but you know, you're packing the food, you're posing the worm, you're obtaining the right to do, which I'm not sure what that means, but somehow you're you're allotted a certain amount of moisture, um, but you're adjusting the heat, you're closing the doors or the windows, you know, you're escaping the creepy predators that are roaming around Massachusetts, um, you know, like, yeah, these are, these are the responsibilities of someone who cares for others. And yeah, I think there's something there, Ryan. I just love it. The, the, the responsibility was, is, um, the, the, again, to, to oppose, I think, um, Carol, mom, uh, mom, mom bell, Carol bell, uh, as you say, uh, uh, what is this responsibility? And, uh, in some ways it is to, uh, uphold the belovedness of the other people struggling in how they're trying to bloom, right? Um, um, and maybe not to like guide exactly, like it's not my job to pluck this person up and plant them into XYZ church or wherever I wanna put them, right? But but to uphold uh, to the value, to resist, to, to see what's really there. Again, the, this, this closeness of seeing. And um, again, I'm just always surprised. I just, I just love the gospels for this reason is that the humans tend to be a bunch of chuckleheads, um, just not getting it right, not understanding. And, and Jesus, like the light show turns on and they're like, yes, this is the big show. We're setting up vending. There's going to be a gate and vending machines and, and pilgrimages to this site um, because that's that's how we do religion. And Jesus is like, no, 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 you've missed it again. Like, listen, <laughs> like we're going down. It, it's going to be about uh, belovedness. It's going to be about uh, a, a, a loving God and a loving community and a loving inclusivity of other. 
and uh, fighting for for justice, right? So um, I don't know. I, I'm getting a lot out of this. Um, this is the hardest part now. I'm going to wreck my weekend now. I'm going to have to rewrite my sermon again for the kid. Like, what do you tell high school kids about this, right? You know, like you can't just say, "Oh, you're a special flower bloom." Go, you know, that's not enough. Um, what do you tell your neighbor about this? The the one who's struggling with their I mean, my goodness, but do I ever have imposter syndrome through this whole COVID thing, right? <laughs> like, am I doing anything? Have I accomplished anything? Have I tricked the college into paying my salary? Because I'm not, you know, not necessarily, um, you know, am I, am I worthy of pay, worthy of relationship, worthy, of, you know, like all these things that we're all struggling with and like, does it matter? Um, um, yeah. Uh, I, think, these... I think to be a flower is to know you're a flower, right? And um uh, many of you have probably gone hiking or walked somewhere in the wilderness and seen a crocus grow and there's nothing else growing. Mm -hmm. But there amongst the rocks where you think nothing can grow is some sort of flower blooming, right? So wherever we are, I think the important thing of first of all to know is to know where the beloved, to know where the flower and whether that is in the church that... Um, need some reforming or whether it is uh, in our community, wherever it is, once we know we're the flower, mm -hmm. that enables us uh, to be that flower to bloom and um, also no responsibility within that. Yeah, I really like that. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I think that's a perfect finish, actually. Thank you so much, Carol. <laughs> um, because uh, I, there, there is a little bit of homework. Uh, if, if you want to do it, this isn't something you have to do. Um, uh, in my anxiety training stuff that we do with, with youth, uh, we speak about it's not homework; it's detective work. We're gonna go and we're gonna go and, and try and see what we can notice here, right? Um, um, so this week you could, if you wanted to, begin each day lighting a candle of repentance. This is in the package that was sent last week, and if you need a copy of the package again with the, all the, just let us know, and we'll get it into the chat or we'll send it to you directly. Uh, it has it has all the kind of the outlines and some other thoughts about what you could do uh, with the Emily Dickinson concepts we've talked about. Um, um, and so there's a prayer there you could say every day. Um, and the idea of, of repentance is something that we come, um, the idea of seeing anew, of turning around, the, the metanoia. Um, what needs to be, what do you need to see differently now, in, especially in this time of Lent? That's kind of the point of Lent, right? Just to kind of like pause and notice in a new way, right? Um, um, so, so yeah, there's, there's that poem there, uh, and it's in your package, and hopefully you have that. I invite you to uh, sing yourself out and take this song with you. Uh, it's an unknown author, um, and I learned this song on Monday with another group that I'm a part of. So that's why um, uh, there's a group called Music That Makes Community. If you need more at home staring at your computer singing that's life-giving, Music That Makes Community has all sorts of cool stuff that does the exact same work we're doing here today. So. I am opening up in sweet surrender to the luminous love light of the one. I am opening up in sweet surrender to the luminous love light of the one. I am opening up in sweet surrender to I am the opening. I am opening up in sweet surrender. I am luminous love light opening. I am opening up in sweet surrender to the luminous love light of the one. I am opening up in sweet surrender to the luminous love light of the one. I am opening up open surrender to I am opening love light of the one I am opening up open surrender to I am opening love light of the one